I think that the business of architecture should be introduced earlier, and I think it should be something that is more of a forerunner. Business of Architecture UK, episode 49. Ryan Willard here, Business of Architecture UK, with a very special announcement. This Wednesday, I will be leading a webinar which will be looking at how three leaders of top UK architecture practices have broke the mould and grown their businesses from being bedroom practices or working in the spare room to international offices with landmark projects. Um, in this training, you will discover how these architects have gone from very humble beginnings, not knowing where work was going to come from, to building these internationally respected offices with these multi-million pound projects that in some cases define city skylines. Um, we're going to look at a number of different things. You're going to learn the three breakthrough secrets for building a dream practice how you can master your messaging to attract your ideal clients, and also how to define your niche to be able to win work. So make sure that you register to the webinar. I will provide the details in the information below. So go along, register that, and I'll look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. And this week, we've got a super interview with Melissa Walford, who is the executive director um, of the Museum of Architecture. Now, the Museum of Architecture is a fabulous charity organization that is really facilitating business development and entrepreneurship and innovative business models and a new way of approaching business specifically for architects um, and so it was really great to be able to sit down with Melissa obviously herself and I share a lot of common interests about business and also being able to empower the architectural industry and she basically explained how the Museum of Architecture had come about how it grew out of her work with the Noose Gallery which she started in 2006 and also she touched upon her own architectural experience she's got a master's in architecture from the Pratt Institute and she also worked as an architectural designer um, for Zaha Hadid Architects and she's got quite an incredible array of knowledge about the creative industries. So this interview is really, really interesting. She goes into a lot of the kind of common constraints that she's seen architects dealing with. And she also talks about the importance of entrepreneurship and business for people who are staying within the employment of an architectural practice and perhaps who are associates but want to get involved more in the business uh, development and client acquisition side of practice. So sit back, relax and enjoy Melissa Wolford. Melissa, welcome to the show. Thank you. Absolute pleasure to have you. Thanks for having me. My, my pleasure. Um, so tell me a little bit about your career. How did the Museum of Architecture begin? So it all started when I got to Zaha Hadid's office after having studied architecture for six years and realizing in my first week that I didn't want to be an architect. Whilst you were at Zaha's? While I was at Zaha's. Right. Um, I mean, it's a fantastic office and I've made incredible friends there. So um, the experience was was definitely worth going through. Um, but I think very early on, I realized that actually uh, being an architect wasn't for me, but I was really interested in helping the industry as a whole. So originally, I started a small gallery in the front room of a friend's flat in King's Cross called Nouse Gallery with the intention of helping young, younger architecture practices show their work. So we did a series of exhibitions there. And then, um, then in 2014, I was noticing that there were quite a few friends of mine who were going off and starting their own practices and I also noticed that a lot of architects just tended to talk to architects. So that's when I really decided to change the name to Museum of Architecture and turn it into a charity and set up the mission of helping the public better engage with architecture um, and also by helping architects become more entrepreneurial by setting up MOA Academy as part of the museum. So that so that first period from two thousand and six to twenty fourteen, you was you were kind of doing it as a as a side activity or yeah. How, how was it? So so from two thousand six to two thousand nine, I was still at 
Zaha's right. and I was spending kind of my lunch times and my weekends and my evenings sort of not having a life otherwise yeah. uh, working on the exhibitions. So everything was done on a shoestring budget and a lot of people chipped in to help. I had friends who helped uh, help me start it. Um, Paul Coates and Christian Derricks uh, were the original sort of, it was the three of us kind of working on it. And um and so we then started talking to developers who gave us empty spaces. This was before developers started sort of necessarily charging for spaces. So it was great. I uh, really sort of had lots of support in that way. And um, and then in 2009, I was able to leave. So I had uh, I started another business as well on the side called NAS Collaborative. And with that, I was hired by a friend to help them redesign their office space. So I did the whole concept design for that. They ended up not being able to do it because the legislation changed on how um, that particular type of work was being done. So um, so the project never went through, but it gave me enough funding to be able to sort of to, to leave Zaha's and, um, and start, start doing different projects. I was also asked to run the architecture competition for Wild Turkey Bourbon Visitor Center in Kentucky. Uh, which was great and again gave me some income it also helped me work with brands and look at how um, brands could benefit from really good architecture so that particular project won the uh, the the most prominent a award for the state of kentucky that year which was great because it gave me a really good case study to uh, be able to go to different people and say look at the value of architecture they were getting lots of press they got a lot of visitors because of that mm. so it was a really interesting way for me to say that um, you know, look at the power of architecture. And, and what were the, what were the, some of, that's, that's a really interesting experience mm. being someone who's being an advocate for architecture into other disciplines and industries. How has that experience with Noose informed what you're doing now with the Museum of Architecture? So what it does is it really helps me identify with potential sponsors. So, you know, what can we actually do for this particular brand who might be interested in sponsoring a project that we're working on? Um, so I feel like I have the experience and the knowledge to be able to talk about how those particular brands could get involved in the projects that we do. Um, so, for example, like Gingerbread City, we work with various different brands and it's how do the brands kind of amplify what they're what they want to get out of the project. And I can you know, from having worked with these various other brands, I can I can help them really identify those. So just for people who don't know what Gingerbread City is, can yeah. you explain a little bit about that? Because this is a, a fantastic sure. item yeah. that should be in all our yeah. calendars each year. <laughs> um, so Gingerbread City started because I went to an exhibition of sort of just Christmas time, um, it was sort of a Christmas time event, and I saw four large gingerbread houses designed by bakers, and I thought, wouldn't it be amazing to have an entire city made out of gingerbread designed by architects? And again, it really fit into our mission of helping the public better engage with architecture. So, um, so we got in touch with South Kensington Estates, and we said, can we use one of your empty shop fronts in um, South Kensington? And they gave us a space and. We had it master planned by Tibbles Planning and Urban Design, who have been incredible supporters and sponsors for us for, um, over the past three years. So it started in 2016. We had over 50 architecture practices participate in that first year. And so the architects respond to the master planning brief. So there's everything from kind of um, fire stations and schools and hospitals, everything you'd find in a real city is there in gingerbread city in gingerbread form. And um, <laughs> so the architects design it, they bake it, they construct it and they, um, and they bring it, we give them the, the particular plot and then they bring it on the plot and um, yeah, and it's just expanded. So that first year we had about 16,000 people come through. Last year we were invited by the VNA to host it with them. So we held it with them. We had over 24,000 people. Um, but that's just because we couldn't get more people in. It sold out in the first week. So yeah, it's really, it's a really exciting project. And, and for us, the response has been, you know, this is amazing to see what architects can do. And people have come up to me as well in the exhibition and said, I've never really been interested in architecture before, but this has really opened my eyes to what architects do. We also have sort of part of it is an exhibition as well, explaining the theme for the past year. Um, so we've got everything from um, how do you master plan a city? What's a future city? An eco city. This year we're going to be looking at transport. So every year there's this particular theme that we want to get these messages out to the public. Mm. Um, and uh, but but 
through the medium of gingerbread, which everyone can kind of relate to because most people at some point in their life have done a gingerbread house or have helped their kids make one or done with them with their grandparents. So it's just, it's really relatable, which are the kind of projects that we like to do. And is this very much part of the mission of the Museum of Architecture is to be able to make and communicate what it is architects do to a wider audience? Absolutely. I mean, we... Um, all the projects that we do on the public side have to go through that filter. You know, is this going to be accessible in terms of the language that we use, in terms of the actual particular projects that we have? We always try and make sure it's something that people um, have been exposed to before in another way. And sort of how do, ar- how do architects make it different? How do architects add that extra element? Um, because then, then it becomes exciting. And, and to be able to communicate what architects do and what architecture is is really important. Could you give me an example of some other ways that you do that? Sure. So we've done um, another project called Sand Castles, where we commissioned architects to do um, two and a half meter high by two and a half meter wide, wide sand castles. And those were through the um, um, RBKC, through the borough. And uh, so we had one in front of the Design Museum by Asif Khan. We had one in Duke of York Square by Nex Architects and one up in Notting Hill by VPPR. So, um, yeah, that was that was great. And the one in Duke of York Square was, um, was really interactive because we actually built a sand pit below the, the one designed by the architects where kids could actually then play and sort of replicate and make their own sand castle. So, again, it's just about people sort of happening upon these architectural elements sort of within their everyday mm. um, sort of goings on and and then also being able to get everyone involved so from kids through adults through grandparents and so so that's the kind of the public face like interfacing with the public or people who perhaps don't know or come into contact with architecture on a daily basis yeah. what is it that you do to support the industry or within within the architectural practices how how are you yeah um, supporting those those kinds of businesses sure so the, yeah through so we have um, a program called MOA Academy which we started a few years ago because again um, I had friends who were starting their own architecture practices mm. who just were really struggling because they just didn't know how to run a business they were great designers but just didn't know how to run a business and so I thought how can we help them um, just do that and be able to sort of get on with the design side. So we run different courses, um, workshops that are almost every Thursday of the year and uh, everything from business development to marketing to accounting. I mean, all different types of courses and we bring experts in to run those courses who lead them. We have a, a great network of consultants that we work with And, um, but then we also have our director's club and our associates club. And, um, we started that because we realized that there was so much conversation happening at these workshops, but actually there wasn't time to really get into everyone's, the way that they, everyone runs their practice. And so the director's club is meant to be a forum for people to really open up and share their best practice. So it's incredible sort of how open these architects of these practices are. We sort of cap it at about 20 practices per cohort. We're now in our third cohort um, because it's been so successful at really allowing people to kind of benchmark their own practice and seeing how other people do things differently in order to Mm. be most efficient. And the idea is that everyone learns from each other. So, So where one person is good at something, the other person might be good at something else. And by sharing that, everyone benefits. And because of the success of that, we have recently started our Associates Club, um, which is a bit more of a training course, but we found that a lot of associates are sort of promoted, but there's there might, may or may not be any um, training for them to sort of move into this new role. So the idea was to get the training that they need to be associates, but then also to help them um, better think about what career path they may want to have and how to develop that, but then also being kind of a, a room for a sounding board for um, for for these sort of associate level architects to talk about how things are done in different practices and um, what might they be able to take to their practice to to do things differently and better. So we're looking at um, then hopefully expanding that sort of through every stage of of um, an architect's career. Mm. Um, but those are the two programs that we have uh, currently. That's really fascinating. So you, so actually you're doing stuff which is kind of focused towards people running their own practices and also people who are actually looking to progress their careers within larger scale practices. Yeah. And what do you, what are the sort of the themes that you're encountering a lot with architects? What are the common sort of pain points or 
the, the sort of things that come up, up again and again and again that architects are, are, are experiencing? I think it's tricky. I think, especially right now, a lot of architects aren't obviously sure what's going to happen with Brexit. Yeah. Um, but we just find that there's there are a lot of different waves happening in architecture. So some architects get a lot of work um, for maybe two or three years, and then all of a sudden, you know, there's sort of a dry spell. And I think it's part of the reason part of the reason that we see is that architects are so busy running the projects that they forget to do the business development side of it. Um, but then it's it's also looking at kind of how the architecture practice is structured. So just the, what you know, what are the different models that are available to people? For example, if you look at Mass Group, you know, based out of the U.S., they are a non-for-profit architecture practice. They work in multiple different sites. They get grants for projects. They initiate their own pro- um, projects. So, as well for us, it's also about exposing architects to different ways of working um, and sharing with them different kinds of practices and how they operate. Um, but I think that, yeah, business development is always a tricky one for people. I think marketing, just knowing how to get their name out there, how to differentiate themselves mm. as well. Um, a lot of architects on their websites, you know, they're award-winning practices. Well, most of them are award-winning practices. So how do, beyond that, how do you, how do you differentiate yourself? How do you write about yourself? So again, that you're relatable to the people who might hire you. Um, you know, there's something as we all know, that there's an architecture speak and then speak that sort of other people might understand. So it's it's just making sure that they're writing about their work in sort of interesting ways that people can then, um, you know, decide that they might want to hire them on based on. And what are the kind of common themes that you see occurring in the, say, at the, the conversations of people working within practices mm. um, and who are looking to progress their career to that associate route? Is there a similarity between that conversation and the and the conversations that's happening in independent practices. Yeah, I mean, I think that there I mean, the struggles are sort of similar. Um, you know, I think time management is always a you know is always a big one, um, and also leadership as well. I think a lot of associates want to be good leaders. They might not know how. They might not know how to sort of deal with different situations. So I think, you know, those are very sort of similar between the director level and the associate level. Mm. And I think quite a few of those associates probably want to go off and start their own practices at some point as well. So they, I think most associates probably want to learn a bit more about how the business is run. And, um, you know, depending on the practice and depending on the director, there may be sort of more or less levels of transparency. But actually, I think for the industry, the more the directors are able to share how the business is actually run um, with the, with that associate level architects, I think they would just they would really understand you know why decisions are being made um, and you know when mistakes happen, why what you know and I think the industry will benefit as a whole because as those associates go off and start their own practices, they'll benefit from that knowledge and that experience and hopefully not make those mistakes in their own practice. Mm. And for you, what what kinds of things do you think are interesting in terms of like innovative business models that give architects um, more diversity or opportunity to, to, you know, protect their businesses over the long term? Yeah, I think just being innovative in the way that they start their projects. I think that's something I think... I think a lot of architects feel like they need to be hired by people. And actually, I think there's a lot of ways that architects can initiate projects themselves. Like, for example, if you look at Studio Octopi with the Thames Bath project, I mean, it's such a great idea. There's so many, um, so many sort of opportunities there. It's, it's just trying to figure out ways of realizing those projects. Um, can you partner with various community groups to see something come to fruition? Um can you look at different causes? You know, what are what are the pain points for, let's say, um, people with different medical issues? With you know, for people who've suffered from strokes, from people who've um, suffered from 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 other um, illnesses. You know, what are ways that architects can kind of innovate to help help those particular people? And maybe there are lessons to be learned about that. And maybe there are certain projects that can come out of those for the benefit of everyone. Mm. So I just think it's kind of looking for opportunities. I also think it's uh, reaching out to different industries. So we've run two conferences on neuroscience and architecture. 
So where neuroscientists are looking at ways that people use spaces, um, is there an opportunity there for architects to do projects with neuroscientists and develop things further, um, whether they're just maybe theoretical projects or whether they're real projects. But um, I see the I, think, I see the industry becoming more multidisciplinary kind of as we grow. And I think architects have to decide, you know, what industries are they interested in, which, again, helps them to differentiate themselves from other people mm. and uh, potentially work in different ways. And how is your own personal experience in running an organization in a business, how does that influence how you communicate with architects or can like facilitate other sorts of business expertise for architects? Yeah, I mean, I think being a director myself and having a team of people that I lead and um, that I mentor and having kind of similar issues of having to bring money into pay staff, pay rent, pay everything else that we need to pay. And, um, and also to support our projects, I think I, I have sort of similar concerns and similar issues. So hopefully I can relate to them in terms of just the, the business side of, of just, um, yeah, just running a business. Mm. And, and, and how is your, how is your business set up? How's the, you were saying earlier, it's set up as a, as a charity. Yes. So we are a charity and, um, the, one of the reasons for that is that we just want to make sure that architects understand that everything we do is for them. Um, in order for them to to grow, to learn, to benefit, even the public projects that we do is all about um, helping the public understand what architects do in order to hopefully hire architects in the future. Mm. So um, yeah, everything that we do is is really sort of for architects, and and it's very much about giving back to the industry. So all the money that comes in goes back out to programs and projects for them. The more that we can do for free, the more subsidized programming we can do, um, the better. So so we're just working at ways of being able to do more. We'd like to become a grant-giving body. Mm. Um, so kind of like the Graham Foundation is for the U.S., we would like to become the grant-giving body for the U.K. and be able to help people do more research, do more innovation, and, um, and just generally support entrepreneurship in architecture so you'd be actually a, a body that was able to facilitate grants for architects to be able to do their own Correct. projects yeah. amazing yeah yeah That's yeah. Really so we're exciting. yeah we are working so we're working towards that and obviously having our own permanent space as well to be able to do have a series of exhibitions constantly running and to be educating people about architecture and how do you see your relationship with some of the institutional bodies of architecture and do you like do you work in conjunction with them? Are you supportive, or do you think that there are things that the the, the governing bodies could be doing better? Yeah, I mean, I think we kind of we operate very independently of other organizations. I mean, there's so many great organizations out there in the mm. UK, um, but I really feel like our mission is to educate the public about architecture and just make sure that the programming that we do uh, facilitates that through through doing these projects that exist in public spaces um, and the entrepreneurship courses um, very much about very much about um, yeah just generally supporting architects mm. and where and where do you think like in the in your experience as an architect and in architectural education do you think that architectural education there is more scope for entrepreneurship coming in as as a, at an earlier stage as a discussion and how could that be facilitated yeah i mean although it, it, again it's 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 hard because i think until you've actually worked and you understand what it means to be an architect in practice i think it's hard to understand what the business of architecture might be so I think the schools that have work placements are really valuable because it allows people to get into practice and really understand what it means to, to, to work as an architect. And so therefore what the challenges might be. And so in terms of the business side of it as well, what, uh, what's going on. But I think, I think that the business of architecture should be introduced earlier. Mm. And I think it should be something that is more of a forerunner. And I think that architecture schools do projects that potentially can be, let's say, commercialized, um, or, or perhaps you know, there's some brand alignment. So I think, I think that schools should perhaps explore those areas a bit more 
and see how the projects that their students are creating could then go off and either become projects themselves or they should encourage them to try to develop them a bit further so that they can be realized. And then as soon as they try to realize the projects, they will come across these bigger issues of you know how they're funded, how to organize them, project management, all those skills that will benefit them when they become an architect. Um, and so by having that experience, I think that would be valuable mm. earlier on than, than just doing theoretical projects. Yeah, yeah. And so what's next for the Museum of Architecture? What have you got planned for 2019? And how are you growing yeah. over, the next, over the next few years? So um, hopefully we will have a permanent space um, within the next few years. We are also launching a school for creative thinkers this year, which is um, which has come out of all the workshops that we've done for our families. So over the past three years, we've had um, 1,800 people participate in our gingerbread housemaking workshops. And a lot of people say, well, what else do you do for the rest of the year? And so we decided to start a program for families, which is launching on April 27th. And um, it's all based on biomimicry. So it's looking at how animals build their homes um, and then how that relates to architecture and then creating projects around that. So, for example, we'll be looking at birds' nests and then we'll look at the birds' nest stadium, the Olympic stadium, and then we'll have the kids do weaving as a means of making um, an architectural structure. So whether that they decide to make it a home or a pavilion or whatever they'd like to do, but the concept of weaving um, is the architectural element that comes out of the bird's nest. So we'll be looking at lots of different animals and kind of how they build their homes and um, and then how that then relates to architecture and getting kids to sort of think in those, in those kinds of ways. And so that'll be our first course and then we'll keep developing that further. Mm. Um, we are also working on our treehouse project that we're hoping to do next year. And that will be five tree houses in a public park. Um, so we're just the very sort of early stages of that project, but that's really exciting. And, um, we've got a pavilion going on in King's Cross this year for London Festival of Architecture. And we are also in our, uh, third year of, um, a platform for women to speak. So it's a kind of a women in architecture conference, but it's not about women in architecture. It's right. just a, it's a platform for women to speak, um, based on a particular topic. So, oh, and we also have a playground going up in Sloan Square, and um, that is a collaboration between an artist and an architect, Lily Jenks, and that'll be up for the month of June as well. So yeah, there's lots, great, lots going on. And ha- and if if there are young practices or architects listening to this podcast how's the best way for them to get involved with some of your trainings your development your courses sure so it's um, they can look on our website which is museumofarchitecture.org and they can find all of our programming there brilliant yeah melissa thank you so much thank you so much thanks so that is a wrap thank you for listening the views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.